Uh, thank you for taking the time to, to come and hear this presentation. I want to begin by describing myself just for a second. I've been working with environmental organizations since 1971 here in Washington. Started working on the coal strip mining reclamation law that President Carter signed in 1976. And went on to other coal related issues and synthetic fuels and then Clean Air Act and the pesticide law, etc. So I've always been an environmental advocate. But I've come to understand in the most recent years that the real issue, the showstopper issue, is climate change. And we can't ignore the Clean Water Act and you know, cleaning up our air and uh, the, the concerns that Norris and other asthmatics have. But when you really look at what the long-term future is, and I'm looking at this, this audience and I'm seeing that for the most part we're going we're gonna to miss the worst of it. But our children and grandchildren, without question, are going to see the effects of increasing world temperature. And I am of the belief, and my wife says, don't talk to our son about this, that we may have reached a turning point where it may be almost too late to literally bring down the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere to such a level that the world average temperature would not be affected by what remains up there. The problem is China, India, even the United States, we're continuing to burn even more fossil fuels, adding more to the problem. So as Norris said, we've got two problems, and the Department of Defense has a significant problem because they look at the long-term uh, future for world oil, and they see real concern about the Department of Defense having certain supply of jet fuel, of diesel fuel, for our combat missions. So they're beginning to look at converting coal to liquids, which is going to add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And I don't believe that uh, the Obama administration is going to support that approach, just turning uh, Montana and Wyoming's coal to uh, synthetic liquids. What are the other options? Well, frankly, Department of Defense hasn't come up with a plan B. And we think that this approach, which is not something that we devised, it's something that we borrowed from General Atomics in California, uh, Argon Labs, um, Oak Ridge National Labs, have all been doing a lot of work on aspects of what this paper entails. I presented this paper to the uh, Association of Mechanical Engineers back in October 2008. And let me just read the introduction. It's, it'll just take a moment. And I think it'll, it'll give you the real sense. And I've got six or seven copies of, of the paper here. And after this presentation, there will not be a quiz, OK? <laughs> OK. Um, transportation fuel availability and costs are currently dominating global energy concerns among oil importing nations and sectors. No news there. Aviation and military fuel demands appear most vulnerable since the former aviation, uh, civil aviation, has no alternative to jet fuel. And the latter, the Department of Defense, that invokes national security prerogatives. The Department of Defense must have access to all the fuel that it needs. The Department of Defense appears intent on encouraging private sector investment in production of synthetic fuels from coal and oil shale as secure domestic sources of aviation fuel and possibly the single fuel it will use for the entire battle fleet. One of the more expensive parts of fighting a war is getting water, food, and fuel out to the front lines. And it's not just diesel fuel, it, it's a great variety of fuels which have to come from all markets and have to be brought into ports and kept separated in separate tanks and whatever. A, a major headache for the Department of Defense. However, in international concern about increasing concentrations of climate forcing atmospheric gases may soon impose severe economic penalties on CO2 emissions if nego negotiating treaties requiring their reduction are enforced. And that's the direction that the world is going, towards some kind of a treaty. It may not be um, in the next five or six years, but we will have to, in all the nations of the world will have to hold hands and begin to work together to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere. 
and a CO2 regulated future compounded by diminishing oil reserves, these two dynamics will dictate decisions on where and how Department of Defense and aviation fuel sources are acquired. This paper uses that future as a backdrop to propose a complex and advanced alternative to conventional petroleum that might appear impractical today but could transform pollution into profits, secure a future for coal in the electric power sector, and satisfy domestic demand for diesel and aviation fuels. The proposal that, that we have here is not 2010 ready. It's probably 2020 on the verge of demonstration. And maybe by 2025, there could actually be a um, beginning of an industry to use carbon dioxide as a fuel feedstock. John, before you get started, before you get started, I just want to um, ask the audience, does this sound crazy? Does it make sense to you? Yes? I just want to know, is there any other, I guess, companies or anything that are actually like putting this in motion? Like, you know, just to kind of get a visual of like how this is actually working? Or is it still just still in the experimental research component where we're trying to figure out all these things? Good. There, there are several components to this. The very back end, creating the fuel itself, okay. that's South Africa's Sasol. They're, they're turning coal into diesel fuel, the fischer chopes process. Nuclear power that would create the heat to split water, we have that. We don't have the highest uh, efficiency and, and highest temperature reactors, but even China is working on high temperature reactors that, that would be another component. Okay. And let me follow up with that, John. I've met with Sasol um, on this, and I've described it to Sasol. Sasol also happens to be the single largest source, point source, of carbon dioxide emissions in the world. And that's because they already convert coal into liquids. So this is a process where we are trying to encourage them to maybe explore something like this, and you might have a better chance than just trying to, they want to bring their technology to the United States, but there's no way it's going to happen with that kind of carbon dioxide signature. I've also um, um, toured a, what's called the Pebble Bed Modular Reactor. It's 40 miles northwest of Beijing, and that's a high temperature modular reactor that can be used. I won't get into how that works, but it's a whole new type of reactor. So actually, it's us trying to get this going. We have to, it's probably going to take congressional legislation, I'm sure. You're going to have to get buy-in from the Defense Department, and those are the challenges we're looking at, two guys. Um, but we tried to solve all of the problems, and we're convinced that we have solved them. But I got up to ask you, does it sound crazy? Or we know the cost is interesting, but does the concept make sense? Let's find out. Okay.